Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have a special guest with us today. We have Jim Miller from USA Cycling. Uh, Jim, I, before we have you say anything, I'm going to run through your palmares, so to speak here, the coaching side of things. So you're the chief of sports performance at USA Cycling. Uh, you've coached more Olympic cycling medal winning athletes than any other coach in the U.S., which is pretty awesome. Uh, five-time Olympic team member, five Olympic medals. Personally coached an Olympic medalist to four consecutive Olympic games. I believe that was Kristen Armstrong. Is that correct? That is Didi yeah. Barry in 20, 2004. Amazing. Um, then United States Olympic committee coach of the year in 03 and 04 USOC order of ecos in 2008, 2012, 2016, which is an extremely prestigious award to get six world champions that you have coached over 10 world championship podiums and somewhere north of national or 60 national championships. You quit counting a, a while ago. So, um, I have yet to count one of my own <laughs> in terms of my own national championships. So I can't relate to that, Jim, you've had a ton of experience and I want to talk to you today about habits and traits that you have seen in working with successful athletes. Cause clearly you've worked with a lot of them. And with those talented athletes, this is like the common question that a lot of athletes want to ask. If you were to split up the pie of attribution for these athletes in terms of why they're so successful, how much of it would you assign to genetics? How much of it would you assign to the training that they do? And how much of it would you assign to just the mentality of a champion that they may have? Um, well, the first thing I'd tell you, if, if they're going to win at this level or the big, at the big level, they have to have the full package. They can't have two of the three, one of the three. They can't be super good in one, but not equally awesome in another. Uh, so you, you have to have the full package and probably, you know, for as many athletes as I've worked with that have had the full package, maybe two or three times that, uh, number of athletes that, that were equally as talented, but didn't have the full package and the full package is, is genetics, uh, work ethic, um, mentality, what it, what it takes to win. So it's, it is a rare, uh, they're not unicorns, but the full <laughs> package is rare. It doesn't come along every day. Yeah. So when you mentioned that, uh, the, the odds of them actually achieving that potential and achieving success at the highest level. Is there a common barrier that those athletes run into that stop them from achieving that? Or is it individually variable? Yeah, it's individual. Uh, for sure. It's individually variable. It's, it's really, and it, it comes down to what each person wants for themselves in their life. Right. Uh, if you're uberly genetic, genetically gifted, uh, maybe you don't have to work as hard and you still achieve results. Um, but that gives you the, the flexibility of having a little bit of social life. If you do have a ceiling on your genetics, maybe you have to train and be so diligent about your craft that you have zero social life. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it, it comes down to what each individual person really wants out of life for themselves. And then you get that rare person who has the genetics, who has the, the work ethic, uh, and has that, that warrior mentality that wants to win, uh, above everything else. And that's, that's the athlete that wins. Yeah. Yeah. But we all have um, limits. I mean, that's just, that's just how it goes. We all are, we all are limited mm -hmm. in some capacity. And, and for those of us listening to this podcast, likely more limited in some, in many aspects in terms of athletic performance than the athletes that we're talking about, but at the same time, we can relate to this and we can understand it. Mm -hmm. We can learn from them just the same. Yeah. I want to talk about two different athletes that you've coached. They seem like they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. <coughs> you have Kate Courtney and Taylor Finney, right? Um, Kate Courtney's Kate Courtney has his brand as being this like hyper driven, very motivated athlete. Uh, she, does everything. She, she leaves no stone unturned. Taylor Finney has this, uh, reputation, uh, during his career, he had the reputation of just dripping with talent and potential, um, but struggling to be able to fulfill that potential in one way or another. It's almost like the world had different hopes than what Taylor had. How did you coach those two athletes differently? Cause it seems like their motivations would be very different. Yeah. Well, at first I'd say <clears throat> I had different roles with both athletes. Uh, with Kate, I do write her training day to day with Taylor. He was just in my with, in teams I was working with. So whether I was with U23 road team, junior road team, uh, elite road teams, world championship Olympics or track teams, whatever he would come in and, and 
come in and out of the teams I was working with uh, on a day to day basis. I think it was, well, it was Neil Henderson and the later Bobby Julik that he primarily worked with. Um, mm. But they're similar, but they're also unsimilar. Uh, Kate is very focused and driven and, and uh, knows what she wants to accomplish and is, is good at it. Also sharing it and, you know, storytelling with it. Uh, she does, she, I mean, she absolutely approaches her business with, with turning every stone. Uh, Taylor, on the other hand, was pretty, he was a ton of fun to be around. If he was in your team, you had a great time with that kid. Uh, just a fun guy to be around. Uh, he, he kept everything loose, light, um, nonstop jokes. But the difference was he could flip the switch when it, when it came time to race and came time to compete, came time to prepare. He very much could flip the switch and be that, that hyper-focused, hyper-driven, uh, athlete, triple, triple A type athlete that, that pursues relentlessly pursues what they're after. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of his, uh, demeanor isn't really doesn't portray or, or characterize who he really was internally or inside. Yeah. So it's not necessarily one athlete is serious. Another athlete isn't serious. It's they both can, they both can turn it on when they need to be able to turn it yeah. on. Yeah. How do, how do you motivate athletes to turn it on? Now, once again, if you're just dealing with pre-motivated athletes that are already in that place and you don't have to do a whole lot of that, but how do you get to that point where you motivate an athlete to be able to achieve? Yeah. Well, I think it, coaching really coaching is motivation, right? If you can't motivate an athlete, you actually can't coach. That's, that's, the truth of it. Um, and I think motivation really comes from the relationship. If, if you don't have a relationship with that athlete, you probably can't motivate them to do something that they don't think they can do. Uh, if I were to try to encourage you right now to go, I don't know, run through a wall, I probably couldn't talk you into it because you have no reason to believe that I'm right, that you could run through that wall. And you're just like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get hurt. Uh, however, I think if we work together uh, and we we pursue this performance we're after and 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 built this relationship, I could convince you to give it a try. You may not be able to run through it, but I could convince you to try. I can motivate you enough to try. Mm -hmm. And and I think coaching a lot of times is is motivating somebody to believe they can accomplish something they don't believe they can do, but they try it because they believe in you so much. Mm. So a lot of times I think, uh, even at, even at a high level, low level cap four cap athlete, you're still trying to convince them and motivate them that they can do something that they don't aren't a hundred percent sure they can do. Sure. So I yeah. think that's, it's a big part of it. And for me, that comes back to developing the relationship. If, if I don't have a relationship with that person, I have, I have very little leverage to encourage or motivate them to do something they don't believe they can do. Sure. Um, I feel like it's generally accepted that athletes like highly successful athletes set really lofty goals. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find that to be the case and, and the sense that they set goals that might even seem unachievable? Is that a common trait amongst successful athletes? Yeah. It's also a common trait among unsuccessful athletes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's the difference? <laughs> yeah. Um, anytime I start talking to somebody about goal setting and goal setting for me, it's super important because that, that is your roadmap. That's your, your roadmap to where you're headed, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I always want to get down to what really motivates them. What is it they really want to win? If you ask an athlete at the beginning of the year, what do you want to do this year? They'll tell you three things. I want to climb better, sprint better, and time draw better. <laughs> sure. You're like, oh, yeah, why not? <laughs> we could make all that happen. Then I would be a genius, uh, right? Yeah. <clears throat> or that you know, if you're talking to road riders, they want to they want to ride in the world tour. They want to go to the Tour de France. Uh, mm. If you're talking to guys who've who've won at the U23 level, junior level, U23 levels internationally, then they'll talk about uh, not just being in the Tour de France, but winning something in the Tour de France. Uh, they want to you know, they want to chase something. So it's, I think it's all a little bit relative, but I like to, I like to try to drill down to what it is that really motivates them. So yeah, hit me with the big goal, talk through it. 
let me hear it. Let's put it down, but then let's uh, scoot it to the side and then really start drilling down into what motivates you. What, what is it you really want to win? Uh, and, and, and then that's where we start. But uh, if they say one, they want to be into our France, I'm like, okay, look, let's, let's look at your progression year over year. You've, you've grown basically 3% for the last four years uh, in a power profile. Let me just take FTP as a sort of an example. Um, for you to be a Tour de France competitor to make a team, you have to get to here. If you grow 3% year over year for the next five years, are you now at that level or are you still underneath that level? If you're at that level, then I'm like, yeah, it's entirely possible, but you have to continue to progress and grow. And if, if that's the case, then we can, we can talk about the Tour de France five years from now. Um, if you're not at that level, then I say, then I'll say for you to get to that level in the next five years, you're probably going to progress 4% year over year. <clears throat> and now let's break that down to what that takes this year. So this year you may have to go from 330 watt threshold to a 350 watt threshold. Next, the year after that, it has to be 370. The year after that, it has to be 390. And at any point along that continuum, it, it starts to, to level out or you hit a plateau, then, then we can come back and say, okay, that Tour de France goal might not be realistic for you, but you can get in the world tour. You can make a nice living. You can, uh, you, you probably can ride in a world or you can ride in, in a Giro or you can uh, ride in other races, et cetera, but, but may we're changing the goal now and, and we'll keep that in the back of your mind. Do you so typically, that's, that's how I look at it. So it's a, it's like a, a database approach looking at where they've come from rather than just pure moonshots and then trying to go from there, you have to look at where you've come from as well. Yep. Right. Yep. Have you had situations with athletes where they didn't set lofty goals? <laughs> you had to light a fire under them. Yeah. Um, occasionally. Yeah. I mean, some, some athletes are afraid to say it, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they may in their mind know what they want to do, but they're just afraid to say it. And that's the same, that's the same situation though. You have to, you have to get it out of them and you have to get them to say it. Uh, you know, business that people always talk about, uh, what is, what's the saying, uh, under promise over deliver. Yep. Uh, sport is not that way sport. If you don't say it, it won't happen. So you have to say the goal, you have to write it down. You have to commit to it. If you believe in it, you dream it, you want it, then you have to say it. If they can't say it, then they probably can't get there. So the same thing with the lofty goals or the, the moonshot goals the athlete that won't say something, I'll still get them to say it. And then we can leave it alone and, and go about what it's going to take to get there. Do you typically try to steer these successful athletes away from res like results-based goals, race results-based goals and towards something else? Or do you think that those are fine as well? I like results. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, at least at this elite level, it is about winning and losing. Um, it doesn't mean that, that, you, if you get second that you lost, you can, you can have a phenomenal performance and get second. And, and just because you ran into a buzz saw, somebody was super form, you can't get past them. That doesn't mean you had a bad day. It's just like, well, look, you have to respect that. They also work super hard and they also have these same type of goals. And, and that's why we compete. Uh, so I am, I am fair. Like defining what a performance is or what success is and, and acknowledging that it's not always winning and losing or, and winning is in first place and losing is in second place. Uh, if it's a good performance, I'll say it's good performance. If it's, if it's not a good performance, I will, I won't say it's a good performance. Yeah. Um, you can win a race. And if you tactically went about it poorly, I will still criticize the race. Um, vice versa. You can ride a perfect tactical race. Um, get second and I'll be like, Hey, that's a great race. There's no shame in what you just did. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, being objective about the performance itself rather yeah. than just the, yeah. the goal. There's more to learn from a goal being set and a goal being achieved or not than just simply whether it was achieved or not. Yeah. And you know, it's like you meet people who want to win everything. Right. And, and they're unhappy if they win. And I'm just like, that's just banter. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's, it's, I mean, this is the most humbling sport in the world. You, you literally train 50 weeks for two good weeks that are, that are phenomenal. Uh, you win three <laughs> races a year and you're like, that was a good year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So it's like, it's, it's, 
inconceivable to think you're going to win every race. So you have to say, okay, on this day, this is the best race we can do. And if eight's the best we can do, then that's a good race. Mm. Uh, but there's going to be a time when first is the best we can do and not getting first is a bad race. So yeah. it's, it's all in perspective and, and where you're at and, and what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to win Olympic medal, you, you can't also set a goal of, of being a world champion six weeks before that or four weeks before that, because the form isn't going to line up for the, the second goal. So you have to be realistic. Like if that's the thing I want, that's what motivates me. I'm willing to sacrifice everything else for that, including a world championship that's four, six weeks before. Yeah. And, and fourth place at that world championship might signal you're on track for that ultimate goal. Um, and that's not failing. That's, that's just the goal you set. It's a unique sport in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even at the amateur level, the same thing is just faced on a different scale, uh, for, mm -hmm. for all of us as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If you tell me you want to be consistent, I'm like, okay, uh, that's a great goal. Um, if you're consistently fifth place and let's just take non-bike racing, for example, you're fifth place behind Keegan, Blevins, Riley, uh, maybe Luke, Cole, Stephen DeVos, guys like this. If you're always fifth place amongst that group, that's actually really, really good. You're, you're a very good bike racer. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a great goal. That's a great, those are great performances. You didn't win, but there's nonetheless, they're great performances. Um, yeah. So for me, that's, that's where goal setting has to be really clear on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, because you can't come to me after you didn't win that, that world championship four or six weeks before the Olympics and say, well, I didn't, I'm disappointed with my worlds. I'm like, well, if we go back to the goals, the goals were the Olympics, not the worlds. Right. And, exactly. And, and I think that the same thing happens it, with anybody that coaches anybody at any level, you, you have to have the few things that you're going to try to accomplish. And then there are things you have to give up to accomplish those. And if you give up something to accomplish something that you felt was important, then you can't come back to the things that you gave up and said, yeah, but I wasn't very good here. Mm. And it's like, well, yeah, of course not. I mean, that wasn't <laughs> what we we're trying to do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can't let the, we, we talk a lot about race prioritization, right. And mm -hmm. not letting a B become an A, a C become a B, that sort of a thing. Certainly not a C become an A. You yes. Know, you have to stay focused. Uh, it's speaking of, of things kind of getting in the way and changing. I want to talk about the training aspect and a common thing that, all of us athletes that are not professionals experience is life getting in the way of training. What do, are there certain habits or traits of the successful athletes that you coach? Because they are also not immune from this life gets no. in the way as well. Uh, contrary to popular belief, what do they do when life intervenes and gets in the way of their training? Um, I mean, life is life and it happens to everybody. Uh, for me, I sort of take a, a big picture to it and, no single day of training is, is going to make or break you. Uh, if you missed an LT session today, uh, threshold session, well, a week from now, it's not going to have made you any better or worse. So just let it go and move on and we'll reschedule. Um, we'll, we'll change plans. There's nothing for me that's so set in stone that, that you can't amend it and change it and move on. Uh, I think, Think if I think of a characteristic which you're you're getting at, uh, I think in high performers or successful people, athletes, businessmen, you know whatever it is that that you're a high performer at, uh, they all have this ability to move on quickly. Whether they're moving on from winning, they're moving on from losing, they're moving on from uh, a day going wrong, they're moving on from um, life problems, whatever. Uh, they always quickly move past and move on to the next thing. Uh, I think that's a pretty common trait. It's, it's like, how long do you dwell on a failure? Uh, yes, learn from it, break it down, uh, debrief it, uh, talk about it, understand why it happened. Now move on, forget it, and we're on to the next thing. Uh, mm. I think the same thing when, you, when you're successful. It's like, great. It is, this is a bit of a weakness of mine is, is actually celebrating success. Uh, I'm so focused on the next thing that as soon as the win is over, I'm just like, great, we did it. Congratulations. 
if we're going to get to this next goal, then this is what we have to do now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think a successful trade is that, that they quickly move on from whatever it is to the next thing and they don't dwell on it. They don't, they don't live on the high of winning for six, seven, eight, 10, 12 weeks, a year, two years. Uh, but they also don't, they don't dwell on a failure for that amount of time either. They just move on. Yeah. It's kind of like Ted Lasso says, be a goldfish to a certain extent. Yeah. <laughs> I love Ted Lasso. Uh, oh, it's good. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a, this is a broad question. It could be a bad question, Jim, but I, I, I have faith that you can pull something good out of this. Um, what do successful athletes do with their training that not successful athletes don't do? Whew, I break that down to two things. One is being consistent. Uh, and two is making good decisions, good daily decisions. Uh, I think great training programs are a, a collection of great daily decisions. It's not one decision that was so great that it was a game changer. Uh, it's just the collection of making good decisions over time that, that lead to consistency. Mm. Yeah. Cause that's the number one thing that we see too, in just the data and, and mass when looking at it with millions and millions of rides and athletes around the world. Mm -hmm. Consistency is the greatest driver. Now there's so many things that make up that consistency, right? But consistency is the greatest driver of improvement. People yeah. are consistent. Improvement goes up. Yeah. And I would look at it, you know, a, a sort of an odd way to look at it is, uh, the flu. <laughs> if, if you get the flu, you miss a week of training while you have the flu. The second week you, you can just barely ride enough to get out of your own way. The third week you start to feel okay. And it's not till the fourth week after you've had the flu that you actually can train. Okay. So for me, when an athlete gets the flu, they missed four weeks of training immediately. If you're, if you're training, what, 45 weeks a year, you're missing close to 10% of your year, right? It's a lot. <laughs> uh, if that happens this year and it happens next year and it happens the year after that, you you consistently get the flu uh, and you compare that to a person who doesn't get the flu, all of a sudden they have, they have almost a, a 12 week training jump on you and you would never recover from that. You never come back from that. Uh, the flu is actually really simple. It's like it's hygiene. It's uh monitoring load. If you, if you train too hard, you go overboard, you, you, you do too much, you make yourself susceptible. Um, you get the flu. Uh, I use that as like a, as a sort of a consistent marker. If you consistently don't get the flu, then we're managing load really well. You're managing life really well with hygiene and, and who you're around when the flu is peaking. Uh, right. I mean, you're not going to get the flu in July, but in November, December, January, very much so, especially if you have a, a training load that's increasing and you're building base, uh, building base, building aerobic capacity, you are fatigued, uh, but if you're over fatigued, then you become really susceptible. So for me, that's like a, that's that daily decision that just making good daily decisions and over time they lead to something, but in the short term, maybe, yeah, if you get the flu this year, guess what? It's not going to ruin your entire season. Hmm. Um, but if it happens year after year after year, yes, it starts to set you back. And the same thing goes for just missed workouts, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you miss, you miss one workout one week and then you miss another one. You miss another one <clears throat> Your competitions one to two weeks ahead of you. Once you get to that big goal event that you have uh, potentially, I mean, everybody misses, right? That's another thing that's important to remember, but still life is life. Yeah. But still that's a, that's a really good way to think of it. And from a cumulative perspective, because that's what matters on race day. It's not the, like you said, you don't worry about one single day but you worry about the cumulative effect of bad habits, right? And what they can yeah, cause. Yeah. That's right. What do, um, from a mentality perspective, do you find that successful athletes treat training and racing separately? Like, is there an entirely different mindset? And what I'm getting at here is a lot of athletes mention the fact that, you know, they remember those hard training sessions that they had to get them through those tough moments on race day. But do you find that successful athletes just, treat them separately or do they kind of overlap and have the same mentality on those two different scenarios? I think they tend to have the same mentality, but I think that mentality can differ in, in whatever training cycle you're in, right? Base miles. If you're, if you're doing a volume build, it doesn't require you to come out of the house 
just jacked on motivation every single day, right? I mean, you can literally just throw your leg over the bike and go out and put in your time and that's good enough. Uh, vice versa, when you start getting into the intensity and you start building thresholds and you start building anaerobic capacities, that does take the same sort of psychology to, to get through the workout. So I think it's, it's dependent on, on the time of year and what you're doing. But I also think that if you don't develop that warrior in training, it's really hard to find that warrior in racing. Mm. Uh, so for me, the training uh, is equal parts physiology and psychology. So you, you do have to find that warrior. You do have to find that, that, that dark spot that you can go to and know you can go there because when you get into racing and you have to go there, you have to be confident in knowing that you can go there and come back. Hmm. From that same perspective, you know, we taper athletes before they get to a big event. Do you taper them psychologically as well? Do you, do you find ways to do that? Or do you feel like we have a bit more endurance in that regard to, to keep the fight in us? Yeah. Mentally, I think, I think anytime you start peaking an athlete, uh, physically they feel great because the load, the volume, the intensity has all come off. So they, they, you know, like for me, the telltale sign is they're, they're actually trying to sneak in a workout or, to, or a interval or a rep. They just want to test themselves. Um, or they're not sleeping super well because they have so much energy. They, they just don't need that much sleep anymore. Um, so I think, I think, uh, physically I always feel really, really good psychologically. Uh, it's, it's just sort of that this is building to this crescendo of what we're trying to do. And yes, there's a little bit of anxiety associated with it because it's hard and you're doing something hard and hard things are hard. That's why they're called hard. Um, <laughs> right. Th that's also normal, but I think, uh, the confidence in that comes from knowing that the preparation, the planning was, was tip top. And that yes, while they're nervous or they're anxious about it, they do know and have that confidence that they're prepared for the task. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I think that psychology piece had to have had to be developed over the course of time and, and through the training and through the racing. But when you get to the peak, it's, it should be intact and it should be there. Mm. I don't think you have to do much with it. Right. When you're prepare, preparing like the pre-race plan or strategy with your athletes, um, and how they're going to execute, are there, is there a typical model that you follow to get them focused and in the right headspace? Do you look back on what they've achieved or do you just focus on the goal they need to achieve? Yeah, I think, uh, when it comes to goals and races and, and, and how you approach the race, uh, to me, it's, it's where they're at at the moment, uh, defines what they tactically can pull off. Uh, and then also you have to take into consideration their competitors, right? What are, where are their competitors right now? What do they have? What do they have to do to beat you? And what do you do have to beat them? Uh, if you can break down a race into as simple as you can, and you have like one or two or three things you have to accomplish. And if you can accomplish these things, they're going to put you in position. Um, that, that then makes the race less difficult to think about. Cause you're like, okay, I just have to do these three things in the first lap. We're talking about 11 minutes. If it's cross country, uh, mm -hmm. if I do that, I'm going to be in a great position to, to pursue my goal. That gets a whole lot simpler than thinking about, okay, I've got to get a good start. I've got to get in this position. I got to do this. And then I've got six more laps I have to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. So I try to break it down to just like, look, if we want to beat this person or beat these people, these are the few things we have to do. These are the few scenarios we want to accomplish. If we can get here, then you're going to have a great chance and, and it'll take care of itself. Um, road racing, same thing. It's like, uh, how do you make the selection? How do you not spend energy? Uh, how do you fuel for four hours later? Um, the simple things like you got to make the selection. If there's wind, you have to, you have to, you have to get in position for the wind. You have to make the selection. Then you have to sit for two or three hours. Uh, mm. Bike racing, there's always plenty of opportunity. You can find opportunity everywhere. It's like race went super hard. You got through some crosswind. Everybody set up. Hey, great time to attack. Except you have a hundred k to go. <laughs> so, so yeah. it's not just seeing the opportunity, and taking it because you see an opportunity. It's it's choosing the right opportunity uh, mm. and ignoring the the other opportunities. And that thought's also kind of life, right? I mean, there's opportunity everywhere around us. You just have to know what it is, what you're trying to accomplish, and and then choose the right opportunity for that, that task. Yeah. So this is, uh, 
you're breaking down the, instead of putting the weight on you, you've got to win the world championship today. Good luck. Go for it. You've done a knee for you. because there tends to be that void where it's like, you look back, great. I've accomplished my training. I'm coming into it. And now I still feel like I have this huge goal to achieve, which is winning or whatever it may be. I like that concept of, okay, so what are the necessary moves or things that need to happen within the race to get you there? Super. That's a great yeah. tip. Actionable for all yeah. of us. Yeah. And they're, they're, uh, and it's really individual dependent, right? I mean, I think you learn the very most about bike racing when you have the least amount of form, because now you, you can't go to power. You have to think through the bike race. Uh, I think this is why average bike racers make great coaches is because they just couldn't go to their guns and twist the throttle and, and make a selection. They had to actually think how to get into that selection because they didn't have that, that, that accelerator they could step on. Um, vice versa, when you have really talented athletes and they're not on tip top form, it's like, look, this is your opportunity to learn how to race a bike. It doesn't, because you're not in tip top form is not your chance to say, well, I'm not going to 10th is going to be good for me today. And I'm just going to race to 10th. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, you still have an obligation to try to win. Uh, hmm. you have to think your way through it. You have to try, uh, you have to use your strengths and your, uh, try to eliminate your weaknesses. Um, and then at the end of the day, if you end up eighth, then eighth is the best you could do. And we'll be happy with that, but that's your chance to learn how to bike race. Yeah. Poor fitness isn't an excuse for poor effort, right? Exactly. And it's in those moments that we le- tend to learn the most <laughs> constrained on resources. You get real creative, right? <laughs> yeah. That's how it goes. Uh, have you noticed pre-race routines or habits from your successful athletes that are consistent across? Cause you know, you have Kristen Armstrong, and she's doing time trials. And then you have Kate Courtney and she's doing cross country Olympic. And then you have somebody like Keegan who's doing these days, more marathon stuff. And you have Taylor Finney on the track. So you've, you've yep. seen athletes like all over the spectrum, it, whether it's visualization, a specific like warm up format or things they do to get in the zone or their specific traits that they do pre-race. Yeah. So I think pre-race, pre-race days, pre-race rituals, I think the more automatic you can make them autonomous the better the day is. Uh, the last thing you want is somebody waking up at eight o'clock in the morning and then debating whether they should go for a morning spin or have breakfast first. Mm. It's like <laughs> part of preparing, part of planning is have, have already worked through that and you know exactly what you're doing. Yes, if you want to, you know, you have a C race, you want to you want to think about trying something else. I'm like, great, let's try something else. Um, but uh, an A race, absolutely not. We should have already figured it out. If we didn't figure it out, then that's that's poor planning. That's poor preparation on our part. Um, but yeah, race day has to be as autonomous as it is. And it can be all over the board. Uh, I had a world tour guy that raced grand tours. Uh, he would do four or four, five hours uh, the two days leading into the grand tour. And you're wow. like, well, you're just extending his grand tour. Right. But for him, <laughs> if he didn't do that, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't metabolically efficient. He wasn't, uh, opened up. He wasn't ready for those first couple of days. And mm-hmm. if something happened in those first few days, there were separations, there were splits, uh, you had a crosswind, whatever he would always get dropped. So we, we ended up, uh, figuring out that if we did these four or five hour days and they weren't hard, they were just long. Um, he fueled afterwards, refueled afterwards. It, it physically wasn't a cost to him, but he was, his body was turned on and he was, uh, capable of making selections early in races. Hmm. If, if you could look at the race and say in this week, uh, this first week, there's not really anything tough until Thursday or Friday, then yeah, you could use those first three days in the race as the opener. But if there was a prologue that was important or a time trial early or a, you know, you see this in the, in the tours, the grand tours all the time, you see these little five K mountain top finishes in week one that don't look like a big day, but turns out to be monstrously difficult. Uh, then yeah, we would add the four or five hours beforehand and he would come into it rolling and, and good to go. But it is really individual, but it, it has to be autonomous. You have to do the planning and preparation before you have to experiment. You have to know what works, what doesn't work. And then when you get into your A races, it's, it's just automatic. You don't debate it. You don't discuss it. It's the same thing happens. You wake up at eight, you have breakfast, you go for a spin, you take a nap, 
you have lunch, you go warm up, you go to the start line. Uh, it's, and it's everything from, I take off my, my pants, warm ups, I take out my top, I take a swig of this and now I'm on the start line and there's nothing left to chance. Yeah. It's all <clears throat> intentional and all planned and in place. Yeah. yeah. And that's same like, warm up. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, everything just as automatic as it possibly can be. Yeah. And, and using those B races or C races or even just training days to, to refine that is a great opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, with, we kind of talked about, the, you know, having a lofty goal coming into it. You talked about achieving those stepping stones that lead to being able to achieve your lofty goal. What do successful athletes do when those stepping stones aren't achieved? So in other words, when the race isn't going to plan and it's the big moment and it's their A event, what does a successful athlete do in that moment? Well, yeah, it sucks when that happens, uh, yeah. but it is, I mean, that's why we compete. That's, yeah. that's, that's the whole purpose of it. Um, and I think generally is sometimes you're just going to have to do the best ride you can do. It may not have been what you wanted, but it's the best you could do on that day. And that's that. And, and, you know, in those scenarios, it's quitting for me is never an option. You just don't quit. Uh, if you quit, you start quitting it gets easier and easier and easier to quit. Uh, so that's never an option for me. Uh, the only option is do the best ride you can today. And then post race, we'll debrief this and we'll, we'll determine why it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And that that's the more important piece to this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, if peaking were that easy and winning when you want to win was that easy, then we would all win all the time. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult and it's, challenging and it doesn't always work out. So when it's not working out, uh, it is what it is. And then post-race let's debrief and find out why. Do you ever find athletes going into a spiral from those sort of things where so this is like a common thing where you see one thing doesn't turn out how you anticipated or hoped it would turn out. So then as a result, you, you kind of let the whole thing unravel and you spiral out of control, psychologically speaking performance ends up suffering. Uh, have you had athletes that have experienced that? And yeah, what sure. advice would you give to an athlete when they're in that scenario, when things start to come unraveled and they lose the plot? Yeah. Uh, it, it happens a lot. It happens to a lot of people more often than, than you realize. I think, uh, when we look at other people's performances or years or seasons, uh, we recognize, yeah, they had a bad race. <clears throat> we don't recognize that they had a bad race before that they had a okay race before that they had a bad race before that. We don't see the totality of the picture. Only, only when we reflect on ourselves, do we see the totality of the picture, right? So we think everybody else sees what we see, but uh, really we only see what we see and everybody else is only looking at themselves as well. Uh, for me, I think whenever you get in that scenario, so th this is sort of also uh, a bigger picture of, the culture you create around you. Mm. Uh, I think if, if you have people that will spiral with you, it's very hard to control. Uh, if you have a bad, if you start spiraling and that causes the next person in your team to start spiraling and your team could be your training team, your coach, your nutritionist, strength coach, uh, team director, whatever it may be. Friends. Yeah. Uh, friends. Uh, then it is very hard to control. But if you have a culture where it's, uh, it's positive, um, People pick you up, they lift you up. Uh, their goal is for you to succeed. Uh, the spiral is hard because you have three or four or five people who aren't letting you spiral. Um, so I think when you, when you see that happen to athletes, I think you have to look at the totality of the team around them and why that is, and then, and then find who's allowing the spiral to happen. Uh, I think culture, you know, people talk about culture a lot and it's a super big buzzword at the moment, right? Everybody has culture. Uh, culture is an easy and fun thing to talk about, but culture is actually living it. You have to live it. Right. And if day to day you have a bad workout and I say, Hey, 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 stop. Let's look at it. You had five reps, one, two, and three were a, a grade reps. Uh, number four was B and number five was a DRF. Mm -hmm. Fourth, this year workout was good. We can live with that. Right. One rep didn't crush you. 
that's the, that's living culture. That's, that's part of that positive uh, reinforcement and not allowing people to spiral and lifting them out of that spiral. You have to do that consistently all the time. And that's, that's what creates the culture. And that's what creates that sort of uh, that magic. That is the secret sauce, the magic around you that doesn't allow that to happen. And when it does happen and somebody does spiral and they have a bad day, then they have a bad day, then have the bad day. You still have an obligation if you're part of that team to continue to try to lift them up, continue to try to lift them up, continue to try to lift them up. Uh, you can fail without being a failure. And, mm. and for me, that's, that's what I try to create with, within the teams I work with, with the individual athletes I work with, uh, within the coaching staff that I have at USAC is that for me is non-negotiable. If you're not going to live that type of culture, then you're out just straight away. I know ifs, ands, or buts, no games. Uh, that's a demand and that's expected. Um, and that's how I manage those, those bad situations. Cause life is life sport is sport. You're going to go through bad periods. There's, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And if you're not prepared for that, or you don't live that sort of, uh, culture, then yes, things can get really, really bad and out of control. Um, but if you do live that, you can manage that and you can keep it from, going super deep or super dark. Mm, yeah. A g- great point. And all of us can build that support system, whether it's official in the context of a team or not, all of us can, can choose who we surround ourselves with. Yeah. 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 yeah great point. Um, uh, this may be the last question. Um, I have tons of questions that, that I want to ask you too. at some other point uh, we'll end up asking them, but I want to ask how athletes, cause this one is specifically like athletes, um, Examples like Kate Courtney is an example in the mountain bike world where she achieved success. And, and it was honestly, I think for a lot of people, probably not for Kate, because I feel like Kate's so driven, but for a lot of people, and probably not for you, it was like, wow, she's already there. She's already world champion. But then it was like, okay, so how do you deal with that pressure? And that is something that I think a lot of amateur athletes on a very different scale, but also Mm. relate with in the sense that they had a great day one day and, or they may have some sort of reputation that they feel like they have to live up to. How do you mentally help your athletes or what should an athlete do mentally to deal with pressure from previous results, pressure to perform that comes from that? It is tough and everybody struggles with it. Uh, I don't, everybody feels it. I don't know if they struggle with it. Mm. I find the sport just so, so, so humbling that it's, it's really hard to be overconfident at any one time. Uh, I mean, you lose so many more times than you win. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you win, you're just like, Oh, thank God. (laughs) I'm not terrible. (laughs) Yeah. It's relatable for me. Yeah. 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 And, and so I find the sport just so generally humbling as it is. Um, that, that naturally it's easy not to, to get too full of yourself. Uh, but at the same time, I try not to, to believe the hype either. You're never, we're never as good as anybody says, but we're also never as bad as anybody says as well. Mm. Um, for me, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> successful people in general are able to move on from one task to the next quickly, whether they win or lose where they fail or succeed. And I think that's something that I try to instill with anybody I work with too, is like, okay, look, great. You won. Uh, but now we have to keep going. Right. Uh, mm. it, the genius is in not climbing the mountain once, but, but climbing it over and over and over that that's where the true genius is. Um, and I do like underdog status, to be honest, mm. uh, I will do everything to, to move somebody off that hill back into an underdog status. I think <clears throat> something that, that nobody would ever know about Christian Armstrong was uh, as successful as she was as a time trial so for 15 years. I mean, she has something like a 83% uh, podium rate over 15 years. Incredible. Time trials. You would never expect her to go in a time trial, not as one of the favorites that everybody's talking about. But if you were to ask Kristen going into every single time trial, she was absolutely the underdog. Mm. And she, she believed that she had to prove it again today that she wasn't terrible. Hmm. And, and so I think with, for me, I, I like that position because it's, it's easy. Uh, it's easy to get your mind in the right place 
and, and pursue the next thing. Uh, I, I think from when you win, uh, it's, you also forget how bad it hurt, right? <laughs> you, you literally do. It's like, uh, if you could remember how bad that hurt, you probably wouldn't want to do it again, but you immediately forget it. And you're like, Oh my God, that day I was so good. I felt so good. Mm. And it's yeah. like, well, okay, you, you did, but that's because you got the outcome. <laughs> sure. If you were second or third, you probably don't, you don't have the same reflection, mm. even though it's the same effort. Um, so I think, I think that's also part of the, the uh, I don't know if I'm getting lost in this explanation, mm. but I think it's for me, dealing with that pressure is, is just moving past the past result and saying, look, okay, we did it once, but, but we have to do it again, or we have to do it a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. Um, and, and maybe that's a little bit of, of my failure too, of not celebrating things. That's how I manage it is, is we just move on. Yeah. And if we're great, celebrate it, clap hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, the goal is not like that. If the goal is progress, right? Like, you know, yeah. that, that makes sense. That's, and that's what you're focused on. You know, Jim, uh, it'd be fun to have you on at the podcast at another point. Uh, it'd be cool to, to even discuss more questions. I'm excited for everything that you're involved in, especially looking at the growth in junior racing and, and everything that we have in the USA. I, I you think we'll have a world cup champion maybe someday. And in, in addition to Kate coming up on, on the men's or women's side, man, I'm so bullish on mountain bikes. Uh, yeah, I think we have, we have great athletes. I think we have great talent. Uh, I think we have a great um, development system and, and NICA, they're producing a ton of athletes. Uh, and, and some of those, some of those athletes love bike racing. Some just enjoy bike racing. I think that's great. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you put, if you, the more you put into the, the hopper, the more are going to come out. And I just think we're in a great place, uh, both men and women. Um, and I think that, that, uh, we're going to have, I think we're going to have men world champions, uh, in the next five years. Uh, exactly. Beyond Chris. I mean, Chris is also a, a sure. short track world champion already. Right. And I think world we'll Cup have an winner. XCO world champion. <laughs> I think we're, we'll have Olympic medals in both pairs in LA and the mountain bike. Um, I, I just, I think that this discipline is, is in a great spot at the moment. Yeah. Pretty exciting. No doubt. Um, Jim, if people want to follow you, they can find you at Jim Miller time on, on Instagram. Correct. I believe that's the spot to find you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Jim isn't going to be on there every day, but every once in a while you get some great nuggets from him. So it's good. I'm stuff. a terrible poster. I'm a, I'm a great <laughs> follower, but I'm a, I'm a terrible poster. <laughs> So give him a follow on there. Uh, Jim, as a parting note, while people are listening to this, I'm, I will be, since it's being pre-recorded, I will be suffering a sucking wheel behind Keegan Swenson. So please give him an easy week next week. And uh, yes. I'll appreciate that. <laughs> I'll send you a tip in the mail. So good, we can but, do that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming on. And also, uh, it'd be cool for all of us kind of a, to align in this community <clears throat> behind Jim's athletes and go and support them. You can see all the different athletes that Jim works with. He shares content from them and, uh, it'd be cool for us to all go and support them at whatever races they end up doing. So, cause they're racing around the world all the time. So thanks for what you do for cycling, Jim. Genuinely appreciate it as an American. I appreciate what you do for an American, for American cycling. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Appreciate being here and appreciate the time and good luck next week with Keegan. <laughs> I'm going to need that. Yeah. <laughs>